the typical Western stereotype, especially Western media stereotype, of women in the Muslim majority world is of backward, ill-educated people stuck at home as oppressed housewives. In most of the Muslim majority world, to be clear, that's not actually true. And you know where it's definitely not true? Iran. Iranian women, in fact, have almost always been at the forefront of significant social change and resistance within their country. They participated in Iran's constitutional revolution at the turn of the 20th century. They played a critical role in establishing women's associations, supporting strikes, and establishing girls' schools. As we discussed on this show recently, Iranian women also mobilized against the Shah in the lead-up to the 1979 Islamic Revolution, protesting in part the discrimination they faced for choosing to wear the hijab, a time when women's bodies became a part of the Iranian political agenda. And even after the revolution, women resisted the policing of their bodies again, taking to the streets in mass protests against the new regime, imposing the veil on them. And look at Iran today in 2022. In a way, as the New Yorker's Robin Wright put it recently, the current Iranian government planted the seeds of its own unraveling. The women of Iran, already active and empowered members of society, have in recent years become exponentially more educated especially in the wake of the 1979 revolution. According to the World Bank, the literacy rate for Iranian women aged 15 to 24 soared from around 42% in 1976 under the Shah to 98% today. The percentage of girls who finish primary school has more than doubled since before the revolution. The same kind of gains can be seen when it comes to women in higher education. And you can see and almost feel its effects across that country. Iranian women are more politically active than they used to be, holding at one time a vice presidency, several seats in parliament, though, of course, they are still grossly underrepresented overall. Iranian women can also count a Nobel Peace Prize winner among their ranks, although she has been forced to live in exile by the Iranian government. See, that's what happens. As the African proverb goes, if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. And in Iran, the problem for the leaders there was that, well, they weren't ready for what that meant. Because you can't educate women only to then repress them and expect them to be repressed. You can't allow them to expand their knowledge and then restrict their choices. The result has been a country of massive contradictions. And we're seeing the effects of those contradictions today in the wake of Masa Amini's death. The 22-year-old died in police custody after being detained for allegedly violating Iran's strict rules on dress code for women. Witnesses told her family she was beaten. Police deny the accusation and claim Amini became sick. In the weeks since, Iranian women have been leading an unprecedented movement, a counter-revolution of sorts, something the world has perhaps never seen before. It was almost inevitable when you have women as empowered as educated and as confident as they are. Wednesday marked 40 days since Amini died, the end of the traditional mourning period in Iran. Thousands gathered at her grave, defying security measures that warned them against going there. But they went. One photo verified by NBC News shows a young woman on a car raising her hands with her headscarf removed, overlooking people in the city. According to the semi-official Iranian news agency ISNA, security forces clashed with crowds and the internet in the region was shut down. There have also been vigils marking Amini's death, like this one in Tehran. In other parts of the country, protests are still taking place, including this one on Wednesday, where men and women can be seen chanting at a university. There have also been massive protests among the Iranian diaspora community around the world, you're looking at dramatic images from Berlin. So this movement, it's not over. The women of Iran and their allies, both in the country and around the world, are continuing their ongoing fight, despite a police crackdown, despite imprisonments, despite the dangers and the threats to their lives. So 40 days on, what's next? Are the protests over Masa Amini's death signaling a new revolution in Iran? Joining me now to discuss this is Iranian-American writer and poet Roya Hakakian. She's also the author of A Beginner's Guide uh, to America for the Immigrant and the Curious. 
and Emmy-nominated British-Iranian-American journalist Caroline Madarasi Tehrani, who hosts a podcast uh, for The Atlantic. Thank you both for joining me on the show today. The podcast is called American Metamorphosis, I should add. Uh, thank you both. Pleasure to have you here. Roya, protests Thanks, are still ongoing. Uh, the government is still trying to crack down. Where do you think the movement is right now? You told The Atlantic on September the 28th, this confrontation between the women of the country and the regime regime is the oldest, most enduring standoff in Iran. And I think the women are winning. Are the women still winning nearly a month later? Hi, Mehdi. It's a pleasure to be on. Um, I think from the moment Ayatollah Khomeini rose to power, women immediately became an opposition. And for years and years, I've been saying, um, long before these rounds of protests, that the greatest political opposition in Iran are 50% of the population who are women. Um, one of the things that protesters have really uh, conveyed with no lack of clarity is that they're not going home. So, you know, whether they are able within the next few weeks to um, change the status quo uh, is to be seen. However, what I think they have determined already is that this is the end. And how it happens um, and, and when it happens is only a matter of time, because these people who are out on the streets have already declared that they don't, do not believe in the founder of the Iranian revolution, someone no one has ever had ever insulted up until this year, uh, that they think that the supreme leader is a great dictator and that they are no longer in conversation with the regime and they want the system to go. They want, they are done. Okay. okay. Caroline, we mentioned earlier one of the great ironies of Iran is that the government has supported women in their pursuit of education as much as it's pursued controlling them at the same time. How much has that incompatibility, that paradox, made this particular movement this year all the more inevitable? Yeah, I mean, Maydee, first I want to echo what Roya said. I think that you're you're seeing an end to the status quo. Uh, women are saying enough. The Iranian people are saying enough. We've seen that concertedly now over the last five weeks. I really want to echo, uh, and I don't know if you heard Roya and I kind of giving you some clicks for the start of your uh, segment about this. You're absolutely right. Despite the fact that the systemic rules that govern the country are undoubtedly misogynistic and patriarchal, women are the heartbeat, the matriarchy of Iran, really, is the heartbeat of Iran. You've seen this over the last few weeks. You saw a woman literally dragging her son off the front lines when he was supposedly uh, standing with security forces who were going to be trying to take down protesters. She just dragged him right off the front line. She said, nope, you're not doing this. You are coming home. And I think what we're seeing now and what we've been seeing over the last five weeks is a galvanization of women who for 43 something years have been told that they do not have a place, an equal place in society, and they have said enough. And I think that what we're going to see and how this plays out obviously is still to be seen, but I think what we're going to be seeing certainly is no reversion back to the status quo, none whatsoever. This regime continues to try and assert itself, uh, lest we forget the number of protesters who have died, nearly 300 that we know of, at least 29 children. 29 children have died just in the last five weeks. These are children who have been simply asking for freedom. So the regime is not going anywhere at the moment, but I tell you something, the protests are showing, and I, and I also want to just clarify, when we say protesters, we really need to actually sort of ban that language uh, from our lexicon. Let's get rid of protesters. Let's get rid of clashes. Let's talk about this revolutionary movement. That is what we're seeing. This is an anti-regime revolutionary movement. And I think it would behoove us all in the media to start utilizing that language. And I'm glad you did at the top, maybe. Roy, on Wednesday, the U.S. State Department and the Treasury issued sanctions against 14 individuals and three agencies in Iran for human rights abuses, censorship and other involvement in the violent crackdown. Is that the right approach, in your view? To what degree should sanctions be coming into play when it comes to Iran? Because a lot of Iranian reformists, people who are anti the government, say sanctions have not helped. They've actually crippled middle classes, middle class families, activists, you know, prevented access to medicines. What role should sanctions be playing? Look, we can always say, and this has been the oldest 
debate over are sanctions good or bad and can there ever be intelligent sanctions, good sanctions that actually hurt the dictator. Um, I think the important thing, the important message that Iranians are sending out is that we are willing to take whatever it takes, even if it affects us negatively, the effects of the sanctions, as long as it weakens the regime. Um, so they realize that in order to bring down the regime, they need to also pay a price. And nobody is out on the streets, take away the sanctions. Everybody is out on the streets saying the regime must go. So that's a message that the people are giving us. I think that these sanctions are good, obviously not enough, but I think even more fundamentally, at the heart of this and the approach that the United States and other European countries ought to take is to really look within and say to themselves, do we have the right perspective on what's going on in Iran? And are we willing to give up our own old paradigms of how it is that we wish to deal with Iran? And are we willing and able and intellectually agile enough to replace our old views and paradigms with new ones? I was at the State Department. I met with um, uh, Secretary Anthony Blinken, uh, Special Envoy Robert Malley, and several other senior State Department officials. Um, I was there with okay. a few of my own Iranian compatriots. And we said to those officials, with no uh, uncertainty, that people in Iran want to remove the regime. There was no, we okay. left so, nothing so. unclear. And, and then, you know, a few days ago, uh, the special envoy uh, issued a tweet saying the people of Iran are asking their government to respect them. And I was thinking, no, that's not the people. That's not what the people are saying. The people are saying so, without so any doubt that they want the regime to go. So let's talk about, Caroline, briefly before we run out of time. Let's talk about what the U.S. government should be doing, because there's always a debate about how much involvement should the U.S. have mm -hmm. in Iran. Barack Obama recently came out and said he was mistaken not getting behind the Green Movement in 2009. There are people who want more sanctions. There are people who want an end to any nuclear negotiations because of this. How does the United States government strike the right balance in terms of supporting the protests without, you know, Bush-style regime change? Yeah, I mean, thank, I'm glad you brought that up, maybe, because nobody is calling for uh, military intervention. Let's just make that absolutely yeah. clear. And I think, you know, Royo is certainly, I'm sure, agrees with me here that no one in Iran is calling for the U.S. military in any way, shape or form to intervene. We've seen how that happens. We know that playbook, Afghanistan, Iraq. We don't need to go even through uh, the delves and uh, of history to know how badly that would be. I think that what we are hearing from the ground, the protesters asking for more more international clout in general. The United Nations, I have to confess, has been woeful in its ability and capacity at this juncture to make a stand against what we've seen, concerted violence against protesters, concerted beatings, shootings, I mean, executions. It has just been really shocking, to be honest, how the United States has not pushed the UN to do more. Today, the UN, UN human rights experts came out and finally they're taking some steps towards some action against the regime. They've called for the UN Human Rights Council to uh, address the instances in a special session. Uh, that would include mechanisms to ensure that there is accountability for the regime who are carrying out acts of violence against protesters. With regards to sanctions, I mean, it's tricky. I think that the middle classes have been experiencing, and, and certainly the, the lower um, lower classes in Iran, the socioeconomically hampered classes, have been um, under enormous yeah. hardship the last few years. The inflation is around 40%. But I think at this juncture, Roya is right in that rate, the people on the ground are saying very clearly they are done with the status quo. They need to have international support. Targeted, it has to be very specific targeted sanctions, but uh, I don't support wholesale sanctions license. I certainly don't support any kind of military intervention. The U.S. has already uh, should have already learned its lesson in the past from that.